Uh, so, uh, my name's Stuart, I uh, work at Microsoft. Uh, I am going to talk to you today about WSL2, so the Windows Subsystem for Linux version 2. Who was here for the Lightning, well not here, but this user group for the Lightning Talks in December last year? Cool, if you've got a sense of deja vu, there's a reason for that. Uh, if you haven't, you probably weren't here or your memory's as bad as mine. And you don't remember that last year I was here talking about WSL version 1. Uh, so this year is the sequel of the talk for the sequel of the tech. Um, and in keeping with last year, the puns are terrible, and I'm going for auto-advancing slides. So at this point, I'm going to hand the next 10 minutes of my life over to PowerPoint. So why WSL version 2? Well, I'm going to answer a different question first, which is why WSL, and then talk a bit about WSL, and then you'll understand why WSL 2, hopefully by the end. Uh, so if you're building on Windows and targeting Linux in production, having the ability to do all that on your laptop nice and easily is one reason. Um, there's a whole bunch of really cool um, tools for Windows. There's also a whole bunch of really cool tools for Linux. And, you know, in short, why wouldn't you want the best of both? Why wouldn't you want to build the best toolkit that you can? So WSL is the means to, to go do this. And in WSL 1, you could go off and grab one or more distros from the Windows Store. Uh, and those are basically the user space binaries that run on top of normally the Linux kernel. Now in WSL, they run on top of a translation layer that re-implements system calls for Linux on top of the Windows API, um, which is kind of a cool feat. Um, but you run into the challenge that you're trying to reconcile two different operating systems and design philosophies. Uh, and in some places, it's really nice. And in other places, there's a little bit of a difference that you've got to reconcile. So there's a bit more work to do in the translation layer, which hurts performance. And then there's other places where they're just facing the opposite way and don't really agree, and you can't really figure out a same way to reconcile them. Um, so this poses some challenges. So an example of uh, one of these areas of challenge is a fairly simple case. If you have a folder and you want to rename that folder, but at the point you're renaming it, there's a file that's open from that folder. If you try to do that on Windows and you ask Windows to rename it, it says, nope, ain't going to happen, no way, no how. You try and do that on Linux, you get a kind of different answer, and it goes, well, yeah, go for it. Life's good. You, know, you can rename that. You can have that file open. We'll carry on and, and redirect things through. Um, so it's not necessarily kind of one approach is better than the other in, in any of the cases, but there are these differences. And as you start kind of working through, it gets harder and harder to deal with it. So the WSL team started with a fairly small subset of syscalls. They added some telemetry, great move. Released it to the wild, got lots of people trying stuff. They got a prioritized backlog of, of things to go implement and started working their way through and released really quickly. And it was great. But the more they pushed through, the more they got into these places where they were hitting these performance issues or the places where it was really hard to implement. So then you've got a decision, like which direction do you go from there? And at that point, they took some, some time out and came up with WSL version 2. So WSL version 2 does away with that translation layer and instead gives you a virtual machine running the Linux kernel. Uh, at that point, your translation issues go away. <laughs> so you still keep your, your user mode pieces for the distros. That sits on top of the Linux kernel. They do some magic here. Voodoo happens to communicate between Linux user mode and Windows user mode uh, to give you the integration. But essentially, the, the core of this is coming from a VM. Now, when you think of VMs, you think about nice, hard, hypervisor isolation boundaries. You think about, you know, sitting waiting for it to start up, which is longer than I want to sit waiting for a bash prompt to come off on my machine. Um, a chunk of memory goes missing when you start a VM because it's dedicated to that VM. Uh, and then you've got an OS inside a VM to, to manage. So that's the traditional mental model that I certainly have for a VM. And WSL2 is able to take advantage of some improvements to Hyper-V driven by things like Hyper-V containers, uh, where they want to start up really quickly. They want to use less memory. Um, <coughs> and then they've kind of taken that as the basis. So it can start up with a small amount of memory and then kind of dynamically grow and shrink uh, as it needs to. So it's a better citizen on your machine. Uh, and then they've got the, uh, the piece over the top that kind of brings back that integration of the, the user mode pieces back in. So all in all, you kind of take a new model for VMs and you run the Linux kernel. And the people who did a talk from the WSL team at Ignite used a Surface laptop to do some benchmarking of WSL 1 versus 2. Uh, Git clone of the VS Code repository was two and a half times faster in WSL 2. Doing an NPM install from that repo was 4.7 times faster. And doing a CMake of the OpenCV project was 3.1 times faster. So performance, I think it's fair to say, has improved 
just a little, in WSL version 2. And that was one of the big asks from uh, people using WSL was, I like it, can you just get it a little bit faster? Um, so running directly on top of the kernel instead of trying to re-implement gives you one set of benefits. Another set of benefits is if you're running the Linux kernel, you've got 100% compatibility with the Linux kernel. So the syscall compatibility issues they're facing have gone away, which means you can run all this awesome stuff. Um, when I first started playing with WSL2, I grabbed Docker. So I just installed Docker, grabbed the, you know, the Linux install for Docker, ran that in WSL, and it worked. Yay. Uh, then I grabbed Kind, Kubernetes in Docker, and added that in. And then I had Kubernetes running in WSL, and life was awesome. It was the sort of stuff I'd wanted to be able to do in WSL1, and now I could. Uh, so I did that for a while, and I had my nice environment with Docker and Kubernetes all running. And then I ditched it, uh, because actually I, I found something better. Because uh, the good folks at Docker had seen what was coming through with WSL2, and they have a tech preview where instead of doing the classic kind of Docker for Windows of we're going to get a MobyKit VM and start that up and grab a whole bunch of your memory and it will take a while to start up, um, we're going to run that Docker daemon in the WSL2 lightweight VM, which means it starts up really quickly, it uses less RAM, and life is generally better. Uh, so the combination of this <laughs> is just... Perfect. So I stopped running my own Docker daemon and just went back to Docker for Windows. <coughs> uh, so that was really cool. So um, this isn't actually a WSL feature, but it's too cool not to talk about. Um, VS Code has a remote extension where it should do a bunch of scenarios. One of them is targeting WSL. So this works in WSL1 as well. But if you're in Bash in WSL and you do code my project, it opens up my project from Linux. And it takes the two bits of the, the VS Code kind of environment. There's the, the windowy bit. The, the UI where you'd sit and type and you move it around and the pixels move on your desktop. And then there's the other bit which actually looks at all the files and provides IntelliSense, provides all the debugging capabilities, and those two communicate, but this one's running in Linux and this one runs in Windows. So those two separate systems really come together in a nice unified way and it feels like the best of both worlds. Uh, so that's really awesome. Uh, on the topic of things that I think are really cool to do uh, when you're playing around with this sort of stuff, um, who's used clip.exe? I love it. I've been using it for an embarrassingly long time. Um, uh, you can pipe something to clip.exe and it ends up on your Windows clipboard. Um, I couldn't think of a better way to represent stuff on the clipboard other than that command. But, uh, but you can pipe stuff to it and then you can paste that into an email, into Slack, Teams, wherever you need it. You know, it could be get logs from a, a container or whatever. Um, you can do the same thing in WSL. So in Linux, you can pipe something into clip.exe on Windows. And it gets that and it puts it on the Windows clipboard. Now this interop is awesome and it goes both ways. You can pipe stuff from Windows into Linux and back and all sorts of crazy things. Um, but it is just kind of another case where all this stuff comes together and it feels like one system rather than two totally disparate systems. So although it's in a VM, these things are really integrated nicely. Uh, I could take some random web server um, and then have that run up on uh, port 5000, again, inside the WSL VM, so it's in my Linux environment. Um, I can then go to my Windows browser port 5000, local host, boom, that's rooted into the server running on uh, WSL. Awesome stuff bringing two systems kind of back into one unified experience. It's on the, the Windows Insiders preview at the moment. It is now on the slow train. Tick these two boxes if you're on one of those previews. You'll get a Linux kernel deployed inside a VM and managed for you, patched via Windows Update. <laughs> <laughs> uh, then you go to the Windows Store and you download your favorite distros, pick any of the ones that you like from there. If you don't see the one you want, it's actually really easy to create your own. You can even start with a Docker image of what you want and export it to tar.gzip uh, and then import it. Uh, all the links for uh, the VS Code, Docker, and all of the stuff for um, WSL2 are here. I'm going to share the slides out and send a link to Dan afterwards. Uh, and that's almost it. I'm going to leave you with one teaser reel for the bit that I couldn't quite fit in, which is Windows Terminal, which is a new app redefining the terminal on Windows. But thank you very much. Watch what I do, oh my, 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 oh my, my, my.